Hello, I'm Ken Bentley, and you're listening to The Sirens of Audio. Are you receiving the Earth transmission? Yes, leader. Transmission decoded. It details the views within the fandom of a popular cult television science fiction program. Excellent. Play transmission. Everything would be perfect. (laughs) Except for the doctors. Especially that woman doctor. Yeah, men are supposed to be doctors. Who says so? From now on, it's going to have nothing but women doctors. When are you girls going to give up? Everybody knows men doctors are better than women doctors. You're not everybody. You're not even anybody. Did you hear that, Greg? You keep talking like that, girls, and... Gentlemen, if you don't like the conversation in this room, which by coincidence happens to be a woman's room... True. (laughs) Then why don't you get lost? What are your orders, leader? This planet is insane. Return to the fleet and send recommendation to Cyber Control that based on our stealth mission, the humans of planet Earth will destroy themselves. We can conserve our resources. Leader. Hey audiophiles, you're listening to the Sirens of Audio, the podcast that explores the universe of Doctor Who and many others in the audio medium. My name is Dwayne. And my name is Philip. Good day, audiophiles. Good day, Dwayne. Oh, Philip, this is the one you've been waiting for. Tell us all about it. Well, yes, okay. I have been waiting for this one. <laughs> um, I, when I started watching Doctor Who way, way back in the ancient world, um, the first story I ever saw was... The Mask of Man Dragora, and it was just you know, playing through Tom Baker's. And the first story, when I just was blown away totally by what Doctor Who could do, was The Robot of Death. It was just, it looked stunning, it terrified the life out of me. It was just amazing, and I kind of got a big crush on one of the characters in that. So, uh, Toos, um, I just thought, you know, she was just amazing, I loved her clothes. She had that amazing scene where I thought she was going to die, where she's being strangled, and she managed to convey both fear and uh, strength all the time. And I just thought she was the most amazing character. And at the same time, I saw her on another show that my father was watching called The Professionals, and it was just this voice. I didn't know who the actress was, but I just loved this voice, this rich, sultry, amazing voice. And more and more, it just kept appearing over and over again. And so I am so excited today. That we're talking with the amazing Pamela Salem, who has had the most amazing career, and I've just loved doing everything she's done. She came back to Doctor Who in Remembers the Daleks, and then went on to do two spin offs the Canamisha series, and then now she's in Robots as well. And yeah, my, I'm so excited. Can't, can't say how excited <laughs> I am. We'll be sharing that in just a moment. But first, I see a rabbit hole. Oh, yay! Me, me, me. So for this rabbit hole, Philip, I thought we could talk just for a few minutes before we get to Pamela's interview. We'll talk about uh, some of the... You've just spoken about a voice from the past that really had an impact on you uh, from an early age. I want to know from you, and I'll t- I'll share some of mine too, what are some of your non, non-Doctor non Who shows or audio that uh, was kind of the, the soundtrack of your life from a young age? Do you want me to go first while you think about yours, or do you know off the top of your head? I can think of one, but you go first. Okay, so a big one as far as audio goes would have to be The Goon Show. I was a huge, huge fan of The Goon Show from right when my dad introduced me. Remember the ABC used to play them? They, they played them at a couple of different times. I seem to recall dad sharing it with me at night time, but I always remember the ABC showing the playing The Goon Show at... Um, Oh, about midday on a Saturday for years and years and years. And I used to record them all with blank cassettes. So I'd have a big goon show collection and I'd listen to them over and over again. I was 
even in high school, I was still listening to them and I'd find friends that would enjoy the goons as well. So this is in the 80s. This is 30 years after the, the goons had started. I'm still, I'm still listening to them and uh, I still listen to them today. So a huge influence. And, and I actually got to see Harry Seacombe. He was performing not far from where you are, Philip. He was performing at Castle Hill. Well, it would have been the early 90s. Yeah, I reckon it was, I just moved in with a... So it would have been 92, 93. And uh, the Hill Centre. Do you know the Hill Centre? I do know the Hill Centre. He was performing there and it was it was amazing. Absolutely amazing. I would have been about 20, 19 or 20. And uh, I think I was the only one there under the age of uh, 60. He was doing his gospel song, do a gospel song, and then he'd do some goons. So he had all the voices down pat. So it was it was pretty amazing to be able to, to see him. It wasn't too much later that he passed away. So... Um, I was very, very happy to be able to see Harry Seacombe. Some other shows that had a huge impact on me. I, believe it or not, Hogan's Heroes was uh, was a huge one for me. I had a relative who was very interested in war stuff, and he, he, he would often watch a lot of war documentaries. But Hogan's Heroes was the one thing that he used to all, all also thrash. And so I was sitting there and and uh, and sharing in that. So I think there was even a stage where in my bedroom, I planned to set up a tunnel system underneath my bed. <laughs> <laughs> just like in Hogan's Heroes. Um, so that uh, that had a huge impact on me as well. And we're about to talk to Pamela Salem, who starred for about five or six episodes in the first series of The Tripods, which was also a series in the 80s that had a huge, huge impact on me. I'm still very cut that they never finished the series. I only got to the end of the second series. But um, yeah, it was pretty thrilling to talk to Pamela, who was a part of that show, That uh, apart from being part of Doctor Who, of course... But uh, being a part of the tripods uh, that uh, that I was very influenced by as a as a young teenager uh, was very thrilling as well. What about you? Some of your influences, Philip? Yeah, it's an interesting topic always. Just just to let, give you some bad news: is the Hill Centre doesn't exist anymore. It's been knocked down for a train station. Oh, really? Yeah, the new metro now goes there, so there's a oh. station where the Hill Centre was. Okay. But anyhow, that's that's just a bit of. In terms of vocally audio stuff my father was into monty python and so we had all the monty python records at that stage and so i remember growing up on a diet of monty python and then watched the bbc series another record that had a huge impact which was well the movies did too so i was loved star wars so when that came out in 77 i saw the film on i've seen the film at the theater more than 100 times that first film and the others almost as many wow. times i was good friends I was good friends with the manager at the Hurstful Mecca. And so for an entire school holidays for six weeks, I would see it at least once every day for six weeks. Wow. And often two or three times a day, he just let me go in and sit at the back and watch it every session. Uh, but there was, a, there was a vinyl album that came out, just a double side vinyl, which was a redacted version of the movie which I wore out just listening to over and over and over again. There was a point where I could actually do every line by memory. So I've lost that. So that's one of those things that just planted in my head. And um, even when I watch Star Wars now, these I know what line's coming. I know what music cue. I know what sound effects. It's just embedded in my head totally. My family watched a lot of classic BBC shows. That I think I mentioned The Professionals was one which is totally inappropriate for me to watch. But I used to watch it. Tenko had a huge impact on me with Louise Jamison, the Amiga Factor. So I used to often search out the BBC shows that had Doctor Who stars in it because you know, I was just looking for other outlets for what they were doing. And so if, if Doctor, if someone in Doctor Who in it, I'd search it out and watch it. Okay. Um, and another audio I think we, we talked about earlier was um, Hitchhiker's Guard of the Galaxy, which I remember being played on the ABC once a week. And, you know, first hearing it like that as a radio drama and then, you know, later buying them all and listening several times. So that's, that's a few things, but I could keep going. I'm a bit, yeah, too much stuff I've watched and listened to over the, over the years. I could keep going too, but let's not. Let's get no. out of the rabbit hole and uh, we'll have a, uh, a listen to what Pamela Salem has to say in a moment. But to get us there, why don't we have a listen to the trailer for Countermeasures Series 1? Five, nine, five, seven, zero, nine, eight, two. Coming soon five, from Big Finish eight, Productions. Two, two, we all know what happened at Coal Hill. Zero, I put forward the recommendation for a special counterinsurgency group. 
countermeasures. It's been a bit quiet, so Toby's got us rather marking time. Aha, my loyal team. You hope you to track down some aliens? Gilmore, there's something behind that glass breathing smoke. Someone or something is trying to contact us from whatever lies behind that threshold. Somebody stop it talking! So it is alien. Oh, it looks that way. That door started swinging on its own. Who's up there? Rachel, this is poltergeist activity. <laughs> Who are you? This is your last warning. It's in here with us right now. Behind you, Sarge. No! Get out of my mind! Oh, fire! <laughs> Nine five seven zero nine eight two five eight two two six two zero five. The Cyber Fleet wishes to report that the audio quality of the following recording is variable. Any complaints will be eradicated. When compiling a list of any top Doctor Who shows, two of the ones that always appear at the top are, a, are two shows that this woman's appeared in, in both of them. Which is a good thing too, because she managed to survive and both have gone on to make audio spin-offs that produce dozens more stories. So our special guest today is Pamela Salem. Welcome, Pamela. Hello, lovely to be here. But those of us who've been around fans for a long time have um, watched you and seen you around a lot. I, th- I think one of the things really distinctive about your career is, is your voice. Um, I know that I've followed you in all sorts of TV shows, and before I knew who people were, I knew your voice. Um, first from Toos in Robots of Death, but then I followed you around different BBC and other shows. So what, what, what is it? What, can you give us a little bit about your history? Why, why do you have this rich voice that you do? Somebody said to me, you're probably in the bar too often. That's <laughs> <laughs> No, um, I, I don't know. I'm mean, just thanks be to God that I've got a voice for you know things things that you need to drop off. So you better you know you, you hope that as the life goes on, you know that stays with you. But I was born in India. I, I'm quite a mixture of things. I had lots of things when I was at drama school. I remember having I was at Central and having all sorts of things put straight because I would say things like off, you must take it off. I remember things like that, which were very colonial. <laughs> Gotta stop that, you know. I think also what's lovely is if you do, if you're lucky enough to get work that you can use your voice for, you get more and more practice at doing it, you know. So it's just something I love doing. I've always loved reading and audio and all those sort of things, which is why I love working for Big Finish now. And various things. You grew up in a various number of countries. So where, where did you grow up and move through? Well, first, I grew up in India. And uh, in fact, uh, we have discovered we have Indian in us, which I am delighted to know. I always knew it. but <laughs> Now we've got it you know, pr- proved with these mad genes things. And then I went to England in, in good old colonial fashion. They would send you to school, boarding school in England, very young. In the, in, under the impression that you didn't learn anything in the country you were in. And actually, it's madness because, of course, um, you know, people have a he- wonderful respect for education in India. But anyway, so I was sent to like eight. No, I, I was seven. I was seven when I went to boarding school, which is quite yeah. young. But um, they don't do that now. And also, you didn't, you didn't see your parents a lot because it, it was terribly expensive to travel, whereas now, you, you find people come back, as opposed for half terms and all sorts of things like that, you know. So um, it makes you independent, but it, it, it's a strange thing. My godson went when he was five, I think, or was he six, you know. It just was taken in one stride like that. That was England. And so you always see India as, as home. And my sister, my darling sister, was still back in India, and in fact went a bit later than I went, because my father said at that point, why do we have to go so young? We us stay longer here. So I had quite a gap before she came out as well. But then it was lovely, because then there were two of us there, you know. And also you learn to make friends and things, you know, because you've got, you've got, to, do, you've got to meet somebody when you're that little, you know. So what was your father doing in India? Why, why were you there? Engineering. He was a, a, a an engineer, civil engineer, and had his own firm. Actually, he had uh, one of the first. He he established one of the first pension schemes in India, 
he was very much loved in, in his company. Even when we go and visit now, people, you know, say what lovely memories they have of him. Very marvelous man. And then we, you go back and forwards to India. And then we went to, uh, to England. And then we went to my, uh, I went to university in Germany. And then I went to, well, America came later, of course, California. And then we ended up here. So, um, I feel quite a mixture. And my family are all a mixture. My, both sides of my family are very mixed up. So, which is lovely. I think we're all fairly mixed up. We just like to pretend we're not. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think it'd be really dull if you don't, I don't, um, my father was born in Salonika and he's Jewish. My mother was born in Sri Lanka and has a mysterious background. We're always trying to find out. <laughs> What's in my mother's background? No, so it was. Uh, I never understand people who want to be all one grouping. Because how how interesting it is to meet all these other people, and then oh, you could always say, "Oh yes, I'm I'm a bit of you as well." People say, "You really should be a bit of everything." <laughs> That's for sure. What gave you a love and passion for acting was it was it being separated from your family? Did boarding school have a place in? Acting? Actually, it did have an effect because I always wanted to act. I don't know why. My, my sister also, she's a puppeteer and also a very good actress and voice. She does voice as well. And she's now a wonderful poet. But um, our parents weren't that, which is interesting. But India, I think, it, first of all, is, it encourages everything creative. It's such a wonderful, bless its heart that the woman's going through such a terrible time. When I was very little, I always wanted to act. And my, our parents always encouraged us. We didn't have these terrible parents who say, you will never darken a stage, you know. I think my mother would have made a good actress. She, she always made us laugh because uh, her, her mother said, you're never to wear lipstick, which she should be wearing now. And um, they used to take the hymn book in the church, which was red, moisten it and put it on their lips, make their lips go red. <laughs> <laughs> what would the grandmother think of us, you know, both in performing art? It was funny, isn't it? I'm sure I didn't know my grandmother, so, so that's a long way from pressing the hymn book on your lip. When I got to boarding school, our headmistress was, her cousin was Sybil Thorndike. They named Sybil Thorndike, you probably won't remember. She was a wonderful actress. And she, our headmistress encouraged acting. She thought that was quite good for people to do, you know, so we didn't have these terrible blocks. I sometimes think if I'd had more blocks, I might have worked a bit harder. <laughs> you look back and you, you, you think that some things came too easily and you, you, you expected them to come easily and then it was a shock when they didn't. But, you know, that's the journey in life. And thank God I've been able to be an actress all my life. It's been such a wonderful privilege to be able to do what you want to do now flicking through what you've been in there's basically not been a major bbc production you've not been in um in terms of your 70s 80s um the need in the line the professionals um uh you're in movies like working with sean connery like the great train robbery i've never seen ever again all creatures great and small east enders um what was it like to always be turning up at a new set and work with all these different people. That is one of the nicest things of acting, I think, is that you, you always meet, you, you become a family very quickly when you're working on these things. And then, of course, when you part again, you don't see them for years and years. And sometimes a big finish, one, an actor will come along that we worked with, I worked with years ago. And it's like it was yesterday, right? as soon as you pick up. I think for my particular temperament, I, I love meeting new people and, and going to new places. I don't think everybody enjoys that. And I think it can be catastrophic sometimes if one is doing too much of that and not focusing enough, you know. I loved it. I never felt as if I was always doing it. You always were worried about the next job. Just occasionally, you think you've got a job to go to before one finished. And that was so thrilling because usually it was, what am I going to do next? You always wondered if you were ever going to work again. At least I did, you know, you think, oh, and, then, and, and sometimes if I worried about it, I thought, I'll plan a holiday. Because the minute you plan something you wanted to do, you get a job. <laughs> you had to really want to do it. You couldn't pretend. You had to actually arrange to do something you really wanted to do, and then something would come along. But I made such great friends in that world. And I, I do miss that now quite a lot. That, you know, wherever you went, there were people 
to your news. That's why I love going back to do these jobs. You say hi and you slip right back into that time again. You know? that's, that's, that's really fun. That's really lovely. What was the process for getting work back then? Was it, did you tend to rehearse for every job? Or did you just get known enough that you started being selected? Did you audition for every job? No, um, to start with, yes, absolutely. And then there was a sort of nice time when I think they knew you, so you didn't have to rehearse for everything. I mean, you got me going. <laughs> didn't have to audition for everything. Um, and then it's funny. I don't know how other people find it, but you sort of go on to a, it's like a bridge in its age. You know, you've got to keep there, but you change the sort of person. I mean, I was often, I think, hired because I was a particular age or look or something like that. I think I did better work as I got older because you're not so worried about if your eyelashes are going to fall off. You're worried about if you're getting, you know, into the part. At least I, this is all me, um, what I was worried about. And there's this time when it's not, people can easily start to forget you. There's a wonderful pool of actors following after you, you know. So um, you have to try and keep visible. I was felt it's like waving on a bridge as you cross the river. I'm still here. <laughs> and that's actually, that's a time when you start, I, I started uh, thinking of other things to do, like producing things, produce the film in India. A documentary film on the Kite Festival. We did put on some shows. You know, um, you start to stretch yourself. So maybe it's terribly important to go through that time. But and then one is absolutely amazed about this time still above ground, and that you come along and say, "Oh, come and do this," you know, because we can remember we the, like these um, episodes that you did. So that's that's again quite. It's very interesting to me that people still remember those, like those, especially today with all the sci-fi brilliance that's going on. Do you mind, Pamela, if I ask you a couple of questions about some non-Doctor Who roles that you had that uh, stick in my mind, particularly? Can you describe Sean Connery for us? What kind of presence was he to work with? You played a uh, pretty iconic role in Miss Money Penny. There, what was that particular film like to work on? Well, uh, because I had worked with him before in the first great Jane Lobby, I think he suggested me to be Sonny Penny, which was nice. He was so easygoing and funny and humorous, and we spent an awful lot of time in, in first great Jane Lobby laughing. And um, when we came to do the Bond, I think I really noticed how he paid attention. I know he's older. I know he had a different reputation when he was younger, being a real, I believe he's got fisty cups got into things like that. But when he was older, he fought on behalf of people who couldn't fight in the set. You know, he he would he even said that. He said, I now can say things that I, I couldn't say when I was young, so I can say it for other people. Um, he, he was, There was a big battle going on when we were doing uh, Never Say Never Again because it was mixed up, um, you know, the broccoli breakup. And um, I think a, a lot of that, to me, he was always on the side of the, the little ones, us, you know. He, he wasn't a starry person who just kept himself at stars. He was absolutely one of us. And the other thing I always, <laughs> I loved about him was he had a tupo and a little thin piece of tupo. And he would pull it off when the scene was over, march around in the hotel, walk out without it. You know, he still looked absolutely marvellous, of course. And that was such a lesson for people who are trying to give themselves an image because if you keep doing that, you get so used to him both ways, it really isn't a shock to see him without, you know, the hair. But it shows huge confidence you can just do that, march around with your hair in your hand. I think that was quite interesting. To me to see how Absolutely. It. The other non-Doctor Who role that really sticks in my memory, uh, as far as you're concerned, is in the early 80s, I was just getting into my teens. And so the the Tripods was a huge show mm. for me. And you had uh, you had quite a major role in that for a few episodes in Series 1. Do you have any memories of that production? Was it was it Chris Barry who was directing your uh, episodes? I- Graham Pigston. Right, right. It was very strange because... I had my dog with me on the trip, which was wonderful. He got his own identity and he was so good and he had his own place. It was lovely working and having him with me as well. But we were down in this castle. The lovely girl who played my daughter 
did you did you know at the end of that series? She had this terrible, she came back for the next series from staying with her friend and a, a lorry hit them on the side of the road and killed her. Mm. And the whole thing is bound up with that. I mean, because strangely enough, the end of the first series, she goes up with yep. the with UFO and, and there she was gone up, you know, and so it's, it's a strange memory for me because it's really tinged with that sadness and so lovely kids, terrible things will happen. Yeah. There's so many things you've done. I don't know how you managed to keep <laughs> most of them in your head. Can I just say, uh, one, one other non-Doctor Who one before we get to two is that affected me um, was a role you played in The Professionals um, in an episode called The Four Girl. And it was it was only a guest part, but it had such a major impact. I would have only been probably nine at the time. And I remember my, my dad was a huge Professionals fan and I wasn't usually allowed to watch it because it wasn't suitable for me. But I remember hearing your voice and saying, oh, she's in Doctor Who, <clears throat> and um, sitting down and watching it with my father. And, of course, it's a, it's a fairly tragic end your character has, but it was just such a powerful role. And you and Lewis Collins throughout the whole uh, show was just such a powerful force. W- what do you remember about that? It's very interesting you say that because we found problems with the script, Lewis and I, and we had quite a lot of arguments with the poor director whose name I forgot. I think he was American. And we, for instance, I had to say things like she's only a bar girl or a barmaid or something. It sounded just awful. I, I said, I don't know who, who, this, this is not what this character would say. This sounds terrible to say something. And he would say, you've got to say whatever it's talking thing. And so Lewis and I worked terribly hard to get these scenes to, to slightly alter in tone. And I think that really had an effect on our, 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 our acting because it did go quite well because we were so worried it was going to be bad because of what the lines were saying. And I just remember that that was the first time I think I completely contradicted the director when he said, um, you've got to say this line with the bar meter. And I had thought of another way of saying it. And I said it. And he said, no, Pam, you've got to say the right way. Go again. So I went again and I did it my way again. And he was really pissed off. And he said, you will do it this way. And I said, this is it. Because if I do it this way, they're going to choose that way. And I did it a third time my way. And he gave him. <laughs> I was actually inside of thinking, there's enough in the can and you can't fire me. <laughs> <laughs> you were right, actually. Me. And, I, and it, it, it made sense. I wasn't just saying it would be difficult. I just thought the script didn't make you know, sense. It wasn't right at that point. So we had, uh, we worked very, very hard to make that work. And sometimes if you get a script with a problem, you work much better on it than one that you can sail through. So, so moving to Doctor Who, I believe the first connection with Doctor Who you had was you actually auditioned for the part of Leela. Actually, I didn't. Um, that's come into history that I was thought of for Leela. I never knew that. I never had the slightest knowledge about Leela. I went, as far as I knew, the truth. And I've heard that said occasionally. So I don't know whether somebody at one point said, well, do you want to see her for somebody else? You know, but I, certainly I, I didn't know that. I was only there for truth. Right. Oh, that's interesting. I mean, fan wisdom is the fact that you actually did go through the audition process and the payoff for not getting the role was they gave you two, so then a, a voice part in Face of Evil. I think I did I do Face of Evil. Was that you, before? You were one of the voices, the computer voices. Yes, was that before or after? That was after two. Hmm. Was uh, it? Before it would have been. Before. That was, I was standing in the BBC club and that's one of those things which you always hear happens in a club and never does. And a friend of mine who's a stage manager there, Gary, came up and said, Oh, Pam, he said, you might be dead right. For this computer was. He went out to him and came back and I got, and I'd got it. <laughs> oh, I must go to this job more often. <laughs> but that, that was how I got that voice for that. I knew me from, um, was he on first thing of, uh, on first thing of the, I don't know anyway, he knew me. And the man, and he just suggested me, and they said yes. So that that was an interesting way of getting that. Um, but to no, I was never up for that. 
Layla, and, and how wonderful Louise Jameson was. It was a completely different character. Just a yeah, jungle girl. <laughs> yeah, she was. So, yeah. Ro- Robots of Death is probably one of the fan favourites of all time in terms of Doctor Who. It's always in the top ten of the polls. And Toos is a large part of uh, why it's so successful. But, I mean, the whole show works. What, what's your memories of... At the time, did you realise it was going to be the hit that it was? What, what was it like working on that one? No, we didn't realise it was going to be that hit. But what was, it was one of the first things that did... Uh, they called it optical blue, you know, so, you know, with the eyes of the robots, that they could impose things on the eyes. It was a fantastic thing for the robots' eyes to go around. And we were all absolutely intrigued by that. Plus the design, I think, of that one was so good. It was so stylish, didn't it? It had a look of its own. Yeah. It looked terribly expensive. I don't know if it was terribly expensive to make, but it was. Um, it looked wonderful, and uh, the rest was. I mean, it was just a great bunch of actors doing it, and lovely playing all these robots, and the danger, and the costumes were wonderful. And we had the BBC electricians had a strike going on. I probably told the story and you've heard this, but they had a, an overtime strike going on and um, they had they would just finish at 10. They wouldn't give us any extra time. And we were right at the end of that show up in the gantries, Louise and I in this room, you know, with the robots coming in. The terror. We had to finish it by 10 and we were running up and back and down the gantry to do another take. I mean, it, it, Hugely, got to get it in, got to get it in, and then pop, lap up. And um, somebody had to come up to us with a flashlight and get us down from up there, the two of us down to the ground in the dark. I, you, I don't know if you could do that now, but um, it was, it was amazing. I, I just remember we just got it in. We, I don't even know if we did it twice. We did it once or twice. I don't even know if we had a chance. I do remember rushing back to do it from the other angle, so I think we must have done it twice. I mean, we often laugh about those sort of decisions now, but it's interesting looking at how the show's filmed currently, where they can just be working for no, endless hours. It's probably good that they actually did actually, for the, for the sake of the workers, put in rules and say, no, no, you know, organise yourselves and get this done. But yeah, it, sometimes it sounds like it was a real rush towards the end. Yes, I think at that time, they... I mean, imagine they had so much work, they didn't want more. That was the interesting thing. It doesn't happen quite probably like that now. But you sort of thought, well, you're lucky you've got so much work. We have, we've got to finish the show. You know? And the other iconic part you played around that time was in Blake 7, which I guess in some part was just you know, a role you walked in and walked out of, but it's become quite a significant role in terms of Kara. Well, do you remember much about your time in Blake 7? I remember having hysterically brown blessed. I could not keep from laughing when I was with him. There's a couple of actors that are like that. He just knew how to make us laugh. And um, we had to come back and finish a scene. Also, I think it was something to do with this, right? We had to come back and do the, a, a scene where I was given um, some sort of pill. In the, in the story, I, I was just I was the, and Brian, apart from the fact that it literally we laughed and we wept and we had to be so careful because he put the makeup on again. He's a terribly funny man. He also had the most wonderful, interesting stories to tell because you probably know them. But he, he experienced going up the St. Everest and uh, with somebody who saw the Yeti or had the Yeti walking around the tent all night long with the strange smell and footsteps. And he had photographs of uh, a Yeti that had been captured in, in the forest. And then he had some wonderful things of the Loch Ness Monster, which I was completely convinced about by the time I finished seeing what he had. So it, it was a delight working with him. That's what I remember. More than we had to come back for this particular um, scene out of the blue against the wall, you know, just to finish off the scene somewhere. And again, I had to just pretend to careful not to laugh, make this scene be serious, because you could just say something and crack us up. <laughs> so we didn't fix that. Need, need some people like that around at the moment. I like to have a laugh. <laughs> I mean, <clears throat> but, and both those two shows emphasize in terms of the 70s voices. I mean, as I said earlier on, your, your voice is one of these distinctive voices that I could, can just recognize in 
every show that you're on. Um, you've got actors like Brian Blessed. You had people like Gareth Thomas. Uh, he, um, even the cast. There was something about the t- and Tom Baker. There's, there's something about the timbre of people's voices in BBC at that time where they were just so distinctive. It, it, it doesn't quite feel like today we have the same range of voices. Is there something different that's happening in acting, do you think, in terms of voice? Or is it just, just the, how the times worked? It's an interesting question. I don't know. I think sometimes I make a judgment about things, and it's not the things that have not changed. It's I have changed. You know, I've got older, so I don't see it from the same point of view. And I said, I don't think they're doing that anymore now. And they are, but just in a different place at a different time. I'm sure there must be people around who say, this is a very distinctive voice. But there must, there are wonderful voices about. It's just that when you're particularly young, I think it, 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 it sinks in. You know, it, it, it's more intense. Maybe they can remember these voices. Now, now, years later, you came on to play Doctor Who again in another very famous classic Doctor Who show. Um, how, how did you end up coming back to, to play uh, Doctor Rachel? I think that was just a lovely stroke of luck, like doing professionals twice, coming back to do Jensen. And I'm so glad about that because, of course, then that led to the spin-off. I so enjoyed doing Given that a character of all the extra world and dimension to work in. So, um, yes, I don't know. I was a one didn't mind people coming again, obviously. There was quite a bit of a gap between them. About 10 years. Did the show feel like it had changed a lot in terms of the whole rehearsal process and acting process? Well, it was a different Doctor Who, so it was a different vibration. Both lovely actors. Um, but had it changed? I just remember we had lots of rehearsal time for the, for the robots of death, which I don't think people have that much rehearsal time now, do they? It's all too expensive. We were very lucky that we had rehearsal. I know Americans is just, you know, just like that. I think it's gone that way in England. Now, you, you and Simon Williams and Karen Glenhill, you just clicked together as a team. Um, and, and it was as if people had often joked about the fact that you, know, you make a great spin-off. How did you first hear about Big Finish wanting to do a spin-off with the three of you? I absolutely could not believe it. It was really astounding. I can not ask that into the We're in a different time span. We were older. We were, it was just one of those things. You know, I think my agent told me, and I went, oh. I have to do it. How would it work? And off we went and did it. And what is really nice is because it is a great and huge, huge course for all being together, we were, um, the, the people who wrote got to know us and wrote more and more interesting scripts for us. They became much more complex and more fun to do. So that was another great pleasure. It didn't just stay. You know, they, they followed us and gave us more to do. Where were you living at that stage? Had you moved to America by then and how did you do the recordings? I used to go back to England to do it. I mean, I'd go back to England and then they, 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 they say, when are you coming back? And we'd work it out. Around. But there was going to be one last year. Um, but not in that character. Actually, two. But anyway, and that I really thought, how? Am I going to do two? I think I was 28 or something. And I did two, two, it's probably well to do somebody older. So I, I just tried to lighten the voice of it. And, um, fortunately, they said it's okay because I think they want to do another one. And they might do it with a remote recording from England to here, which would be lovely. I would love to do another one. So with, with I mean, we're jumping ahead, but that's okay. So with the two recordings, because for the, the robot series, you've been doing, you've been filming them in England as well. So working with David Collins, you actually went back to England to film those or were they done remotely? I went back to England. Yeah, I haven't done a remote one yet. I think that's coming if we do another one because it's easy for them to do it. But I always trouble about traveling is going on. It's to do it remotely. I should be fascinated how that works. So what was it like going back and working with people like Simon and Karen and then Hugh Ross being thrown into the mix for the countermeasures? Well, first of all, 
if you work for being Finnish, it's probably one of the most civilized places in the world to work for. You are immediately accepted in there, and then you have these incredible lunches that everybody always tells you about. I don't even eat lunch much. I certainly ate lunch there. Every day, Toby would make a different cuisine. So it was like, um, you'd be back in family, and it would be like working in some sort of amazing hotel. <laughs> you know, or because we stopped for this lunch and then we go on again afterwards and oh they're all the great lunch. It has gone on a long time because I, I how many shows have we done with I'm not sure. I think it's gone on for about eight years. J- July two thousand twelve was the first one that came out. So that's almost ten years now. Oh you it was probably ten years ago you f- you recorded the first countermeasures. Yes, I was it ten years ago? Yes, I only thought it was going to be only one, and then they would come to another. Yeah, I think it's six box sets, and then another four or five stories in the countermeasure series so far. No, yeah, you've got good information there. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to do a little bit of research. <laughs> Coming soon from Big Finish Productions, Doctor Who, The Fourth Doctor Adventures, The Silent Scream. Nelly! Nelly, what's happened? Her voice! Her voice is gone! It's happened again! Loretta Waldorf as I live and breathe. Listen, it's lovely of you to stop by, but I have an appointment. An appointment with fear, I'm afraid, Miss Waldorf. Analysis suggests unknown life forms approaching. They're coming from my voice. They're like silhouettes. Dancing shadows. Help me. Please help me. I'm sorry, I can't help you. You're just recordings. <laughs> They're closing in. Do they want something? Oh, yes, they want something, all right, Lulu. They want to kill us. Can I stay here? Tell the doctor where I'm going. Where are you going, mistress? Into the lion's den, perhaps. <laughs> the lights have blown! Ah, that's torn it. Lulu, find the gap and run for it. Uh, that's right. You just relax for a bit while the numbness spreads. Then we can begin. Big Finish. We love stories. You did do one story with Tom Baker a, a few years ago. What was that like getting back with Tom? That was that story was called the Silent Scream. Uh, were you playing a silent movie star? That's right. Yes, there's another one. Oh, Tom, Tom and I met in in um, York yeah, before he did that to you. And uh, God, he, there's another person who could make you fall down with laughing. Um, he just had a natural humour, and he. He left to do a, well, he was doing a, a show with Laurie Taylor, which I always remember. Um, Donald Bodley ran York, and Donald Bodley had a problem with temper. He would blow up at anything. And he was quite nerve wracking, actually, when he blew up. And, and I tried to avoid the circumstances where you might find the blow up. But nearly every man who ever worked there had, had a tremendous, uh, a fight with Donald in one way or another. My Michael O'Hagan, he had one when he went up there. And Tom got annoyed about whatever he was doing. And he left to do this late night cabaret where he played a dog. <laughs> Wonderful dog. All he played was he just wore all these hound ears. And Laurie was his trainer, but who was really very cruel. And he had these teeth, which he would eat. Then he would annoy it. And then he would pull this prong collar, which would make the dog bark the right amount of times, you know. And it was, we, we watched it night after night. And then finally at the end, he pulls it and the dog sings Home Sweet Home. That's Tom. And really, he almost wept at the end. But he had us laughing, then he had us crying. Then he goes off with his trainer, and then you hear him having a punch up while he <laughs> bites, he kills his owner off backstage. <laughs> That's the end of that. 
It was a wonderful show. I remember it. It was so well done. Um, and somebody saw him do the job. And I, he, he, he said this. And he went down to the National to do a donkey, I believe. So that dog led to the donkey, let him go to the National, and they pressed it. And London Career, here we come. And then Doctor Who. And he was a wonderful Doctor Who. He is a wonderful Doctor Who. <laughs> Has it, had he changed much since you worked with him back in the 70s? No. Not, not when we met up. He must have changed. That, you know, we've all changed. But he even looks the same, except with white hair. Because he's got a beautiful I can hear him when he's um, doing voiceovers for other things. What's Tom's voice? It's unmistakable. Yeah. After doing 20 episodes of Countermeasures, um, they then decided to bring back Liz Toos. Um, what were you expecting in terms of coming back to the character you played more than 40 years earlier? I was actually terrified. I thought, I'm never going to get this right. <laughs> I'm going to sound ridiculous, of course. But it, it seemed to work. Your voice really hasn't changed that much. I mean, it's spectacular. I it. <laughs> it's, it is the power of audio, isn't it? That you can take people anywhere quite easily with a voice. Yeah, and, and you, you can lighten it and make it older and make it younger and so on. So I read a book for the BBC uh, at the same time as we did the countermeasures last time. I think that was called Hand of Fear. It's another Doctor Who spin-off. Yes. And there were umpteen characters in that, including a, a male who turns into a female. And you don't want to do a thousand different voices. It can drive people mad. So I was thinking, how do I just intimate different voices? Which... I hope it went all right because they want me to do another one. <laughs> but um, so it must have gone right-ish. But I was wondering whether to – I have to tell the story. It's very strange. Um, I was thinking, how, would I do lots of different voices or should I do, you know, narration and just suggest the voice? And I was having acupuncture. And my husband had died sadly, at that point. And I, I went to this acupuncturist just down the road who knew my husband. And I was pondering this thing about the, 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 the voices in my head. And I was lying there and he said to me, the acupuncturist, I have been listening to Game of Thrones, he said, and I can't bear the way it's done with all these voices, these different voices. It is so annoying, I have to turn it off. And I thought, that's my Michael sending a message via the acupuncturist. Do not put on a thousand voices. And I said to him, honestly, oh, Ed, it's just what I'm thinking of in my head. And I was wishing Michael was here because he was a very good director, Michael, and he was always such a help with my work. And I thought, I just got the answer to, I mean, out of the blue, he said that. He didn't, it was the first thing he was saying. He said, I'm listening to these Game of Thrones. And he said, it's driving me mad hearing this, all these different voices this man is doing. I mean, God bless the man. I'm sure he's, a lot of people love lots of different voices, <laughs> but it wouldn't have worked for me if I was doing millions. I'm, I, I just thought, oh, right. Got the message. <laughs> Thank you for directing that. Do you know what's the, what the next one is you're doing? I'm supposed to be doing that one, but I always am very superstitious. If I say it, it'll go wrong. So I hope <laughs> we do another remote. That will be remote as well. So, so with Robot, you were recombined with David Collins after many, many years, and sadly he passed away soon after the recording. What was, once again, connecting back with him, was that, had he had much to do with him between that and Robots of Death? Or was that the first time you'd seen him? How, how do you connect as a character after that many years? No, I hadn't seen him. I'd seen him in, in, in things, you know. I'd seen him doing shows. It was a lovely actor and such a specific case that in that you just knows a very distinctive face and I hadn't really known him very well I, I mean, he was a robot but I wasn't you know didn't get to know him very well during Robots of Death so um yes Robots of Death the other one's from Members of the Dalek isn't it Jensen. yeah that's right uh, Robots of Death I knew he was there but I didn't get to know him very well I got to know him more that time because we used to share a car and chat to each other and they got to learn. That gap was like, it's funny. I'm sure everybody finds that in their own field of interest. You come across people that you haven't seen for years, 
And it's like, the years disappear. And it's like yesterday. I remember we had a, 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 a um, the Central had a 50 year, I don't believe it, get together. What do they call those things? When you have, um, well, it's a get together. It's like a sort of a memorial for years. And I was always frightened of doing those things. Like, oh, friends, who wants to, you know, we're all going to be so different. But I went to that one and we had a most amazing time. And it was, we've been together three years, all of us, of course. Every day you see each other. And so when we got together as a bunch who'd all been working together, it was just like we went back to, we could have been back, you know, in our twenties. We had to then carry on and go and have dinner and because we didn't want it to end. You know, it was just such fun. And I thought those sort of things would be really tricky to do. Well, but, you know, some people do it every year also. But what, what do they call those get together? It's a special name. Re- reunion. Yeah. It looks like class reunion. Yeah. They do them a lot here. It is funny. We were like kids again, <laughs> young people again. We think, gosh, we knew each other better than we thought. <laughs> so how, how did you end up living in America? Um, well, um, I think it's a terribly long story, but, but I always wanted to live in America. I loved America. I am um, two Americans. I don't know what <laughs> But I am not the Trump America, and I am not the gun toting America, but I am the America that's terribly supportive of you trying anything new that, you know, that goes out, that does Greenpeace, that does, that's so, um, enthusiastic about things. You know, I love all that. And I always, I always loved America. I used to love coming here, and I always wanted to move here. And finally, Michael, Went into the, he said, Do you know that they have an Irish visa lottery here? Morrissey visa lottery. And the Irish get 60% of points that year of the lottery tickets. I said, Go in for it now. Go in for it now, please. <laughs> and he just had to put his name in and would it come up? And it came up. And then you have to fill out all these forms and, and that's how we got in. And it was an answer. I mean, I've always wanted to go there to work. I love, I, and I do love it still. So that's how we moved here. But for Michael, he was always going back as a boy. He was doing a lot of theatre in England, and so he would go back across the water. And I, I loved California. And in fact, we got quite a, it was, it was nice because we were working there, and I, I felt it was so much home for some strange reason. But then Michael worked here in, in Florida. My sister and I came here and spent a trip together here. And we grew up in India, which was tropical. So this was totally, I was totally at home being near the sea and the tropics. And we suddenly thought, why don't we try moving here? We've been a long time in Los Angeles. Um, Michael preferred it here. And we, it all happened terribly quickly. Everything fell into place. Our flat got so extremely quickly. We had to find somewhere here. And hey, Preston, here we are. With a lovely bunch of people that we got to know here on the beach. And how, how long ago did Michael pass away? Three years ago. Three and a half years ago. November 2017. Oh. Sorry about that. It's always yeah, hard to get over, isn't it? Yeah, but he's nearby. He he still helps. He's still here. He still gives me a boot occasion to get on with it. He's still close. So what does the future hold? I have no idea. I go from day to day because I have a few health challenges now. And if I look too far ahead, I, I get into a panic. <laughs> I do one day at a time and see what's going to happen. We have a small radio group here. Radio, um, it doesn't, it, we, we do shows here, which we wrote, um, uh, at the community center and on the Jackie Gleason theater where we do it like live radio. And that was fun. And then we're still, we still meet once a month and we we're intending to do a show, another show, more, more with poetic things rather than, uh, written things because it's got to be light hearted and then I, I hope it'll be audio work because it's easier to do audio work now I'm old and decrepit <laughs> I don't have to I can sit down and do it which is good because m- mobility is a bit of a challenge nowadays so um, I hope that audio work ahead was, I hope this COVID thing finishes 
it's partly because of COVID that uh, Big Finish have kind of perfected the remote recording process. So in the early stages, you could kind of tell a little that it was remote recorded, but now you can't tell at all. Well, that's interesting. Yeah, it's sensational. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, so many things we have learned from this. I think when we come through it, a lot of things will have moved on, which we will have learned from this. I'm an optimist. I think we'll know where gaps are in the health system and people have found ways of life which they never knew they could do. And this Zoom, I mean, I, I do all sorts of things I wouldn't have done under normal circumstances. I think it's there's a lot of good to come out of it. I, I think the next lot of people understand, the younger ones, that this world is need-saving. You know, but most of my friends' children are doing something in a field that's quite helpful for the world. It's, you know, as long as they're doing that, there's hope. Can I just say, there's nothing old or decrepit about you at all. You're still as lovely and charming as ever. So, Pamela, listen, thank you so much for your time. We so appreciate it. Um, it has been lovely seeing you and speaking to you. So, thank you so much for that. Well, thank you very much for the interview and it was very easy and very good fun. Voice lock activated. Please commence voice imprint. Tula Chenka. Voice validated. Livchenka. Voice validated. From Big Finish Productions, The Robots, Volume 4. This is a warning. We are the uprising. We are the enemy. User Tula Chenka is currently online. I have already created a fake avatar for you. Somebody's fitting you up. It must be. We're close to something. It's the robots. It always was. Oh, great. A blackout. It's just what we need. Oh, it's not a blackout. Then what is it? An EMP. It's the only explanation. This lab's airtight. If the ventilation's not working, we'll suffocate. I'm out of ideas. The desert. I need to find something. Uh, so do I. Something's buried there. A great many things are. But you're not actually going to kill me, are you? What was that? Skeleton. There are people dying out there. There's too many of them. We can't fight them all off. Stop. You are under arrest. Okay, deep breath. Big finish. We love stories. You are who you are programmed to be. Fantastic stuff, Philip. Uh, really enjoyed that chat with Pamela. She's uh, an amazing lady. Still sounds like she did 30, 40 years ago. And just to hear that voice uh, in my ears while she was uh, chatting with us was uh, pretty incredible. And I can only imagine it was more incredible for you. I had a lovely time. <laughs> so definitely, and, you know, nice, nice speaking to, to Miami. Actually, can I mention the... Since, since doing that interview, of course, they've, they've had that big tragedy in Miami where that yes, building Yes, that collapsed. happened just after. Yeah. Um, it, was, it was a couple of days after speaking to Pamela, and I actually dropped a quick letter to her, quick email to her, just to say, you know, hope you're okay. And she sent me a big email back, you know, thanking me for my concern. Um, and also, you know, it wasn't too near her, but she's very concerned about what had happened there. And, you know, they, at the moment, while we're recording this, they're still trying to find bodies. So, yeah, pretty pretty great tragedy there so it was weird chatting to someone in miami and then a couple of days later that huge tragedy happened and so. there's a big weather system heading that way isn't there yeah just yes it's, yeah it's a big mess over there mm. anyhow it was an amazing interview and just such a joy and privilege to talk to someone who's been a hero of mine a, a voice in my head for a long long time well that brings us to our recommendations for this time um let me uh is it no it's it's your turn philip oh okay my turn um i'm going to recommend the whole robots series so i yeah having nice. just spoken to pamela salem the it is the most amazing spin-off series it took it's taking us to places i wasn't expecting it's each episode each story deals with different things in terms of you know, sometimes it's politics sometimes it's deep relationships it's it's ethics um, you, you don't really know where it's going to go. I, with four box sets in, I have no idea where it's going to end up, but I keep being enthralled by it more and more, and just wanting the next ones. So, if you've not listened to the robots yet, get it, guys. It's it's so worthwhile. And yeah, don't know where it's going to end, but we'll see soon. Yeah, shock me, that's for sure. Mm, what about you, Dwayne? I'm not going to recommend 
an audio product this time. I'm going to recommend a video product, but... Can I just say, you always make fun of me when I don't recommend an audio, and you seem to do it all the time. But you go ahead, you recommend a video. <laughs> well, okay. Um, at the time of recording, it's been about a week since we lost um, Jackie Lane, who was not too... Uh, she, She's a lot of love has developed for her over the years. She's she's very um, she's not served very well with the amount of missing episodes that that are out there that uh, that she's in, and she wasn't treated too well by the BBC during her time in Doctor Who. But you, if you go and have a a close look at what she did uh, during her time, it was really really enjoyable. So I saw some posts from Keith Barnfather or someone referring to Keith Barnfather perhaps uh, on social media referring to his release called The Doctors. So you can get Jackie Lane's interview, Mythmaker's interview, on its own, or you can get it in a box set called The Doctors, which I discovered I had. I was looking at it on the website. I think it's timetravel.tv is where you can actually download or order the physical copies of Mythmakers and anything from real-time pictures. Uh, but The Doctors has heaps of interviews on it. Carol Ann Ford, Jacqueline Hill, William Russell, Peter Purvis, and Jackie Lane. So one of the very few interviews she did. I would recommend anyone grab a copy of that. If you don't want the physical product, easy to get from that website, timetravel.tv, time travel and you can download it from there. So that's my recommendation for this week. Yeah, that sounds amazing. I, I've never been able to understand why Dodo's been such the butt of so many jokes of fans. It really makes me very sad that often, you know, she's just often just... I, yeah, I think I it probably just goes back to that slight accent change in the very first episode of the arc that never changed again. So, I mean, there, there was a... But I, th I think she was acting like having a cold. So the cold may have been the, the change in accent. Yeah, I don't she, know. She's good in the arc. She's great in the gunfighters, the stuff we have. And and, and she's, I, she's so badly served in the war machines. But she actually, what she gets to do, she does a good job with. She does. Mm. She does. Absolutely. So uh, that's it for this week. Uh, really appreciate you organising that chat with Pamela Salem Phillip. It's uh, been an absolute pleasure. So thank you, and uh, we'll catch you all next time. You say bye too, Philip. Bye, Philip. <laughs> <laughs> bye, everyone. <laughs> you have been listening to the Sirens of Audio, episode 68 A Passage from India, with special guest Pamela Salem and your hosts, Philip Edney and Dwayne Bunny. Next time, Elliot Chapman will discuss his time playing Ben Jackson for the Big Finish Second Doctor Rangers. Theme music by the Jackpot Golden Boys. Email address is sirensofaudio at gmail.com. Be sure to subscribe to the Sirens of Audio on YouTube. Follow them on your favourite podcatcher. Rate and review them on Apple Podcasts. Join their Facebook group by searching for the Sirens of Audio on that platform. Tweet them at Audio Sirens and leave your own audio clip of feedback at anchor.fm slash sirens of audio for them to play on a future show. Keep listening to Audio Drama because Audio Drama is excellent. Excellent.